as many of you may know, President Bush has recently laid out a bold initiative for space exploration. This has made space exploration a national priority for the 21st century. What Bush wants to do is return humans to the moon by 2020, where a blend of robots and humans will transform the moon into a 21st century hub for science and a jumping off point for deep space missions. Missions to eventually land humans on Mars within our lifetimes. A world which the recent rover missions suggest was once wetter and more amenable to life and could become home to some adventuresome colonists of the future. Just a few weeks ago, uh, science fiction author Ray Bradbury praised this new space plan, saying that human exploration of the moon <coughs> and the red planet will move hum humanity beyond terrorism and war, inspiring the public in much the same way as explorers of North America did some 500 years ago. On the scientific front, in the meantime, NASA wants to get samples from the moon, the asteroids, and Mars and return them to labs on Earth for analysis to better understand the origin, history, and future of our solar system. Looking beyond our celestial neighborhood, the agency envisions placing new kinds of telescopes in, into deep space, such as the terrestrial planet finder, whose goal would be to find Earth-like planets around other stars, planets which may harbor life. In fact, the terrestrial planet finder is supposed to have a high enough sensitivity that it could image oceans on Earth-like planets around other stars. It's fascinating. But we needn't look beyond our own solar system to find tantalizing hints of life. Less than a billion kilometers away, orbiting Jupiter are some of the most interesting sites of future exploration. The four planet-sized moons of Jupiter, Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto, are fascinating worlds in their own right. These moons, first seen by Galileo Galilei when he invented the telescope some four centuries ago, have recently revealed a diversity and complexity that wasn't expected. Photographs by the recently retired Galileo spacecraft revealed surface features on three of these moons which strongly suggest the presence of liquid water oceans beneath their surface. One of these icy moons, in, in particular Europa, provide the greatest evidence that it may have an ocean, an ocean which may be as deep as 100 kilometers. In fact, the ocean may come close enough to the surface at points that a future spacecraft could burrow through the ice layer, deploying a submarine robotic explorer to show us the first pictures of an extraterrestrial ocean. And who knows what we may find there? We may find life living near geothermal vents on another world. That would be amazing. Now, with all of these goals and amazing destinations beckoning us, an obvious question which comes to mind is, how do we get there? We're here on Earth, and all those exciting places seem hopelessly far away, hundreds of millions or billions of kilometers away. For ages, the Earth's gravity has been like a prison, keeping us forever trapped within its grip. But the dawn of the space age some half century ago broke those prison doors off. And the key to breaking off those prison doors, the key to space travel, has been the rocket. In particular, the chemical rocket, such as the Saturn V I show here, which launched the Apollo astronauts to the moon. But chemical rockets are incredibly fuel inefficient. Think of driving in a gas guzzler across a country with no gas stations. You'd have to carry boatloads of gas and not much else. And this is what happens with rockets. They're about 90% fuel, or tanks for fuel, and only 10% spacecraft, meaning the thing that travels through space carrying the sensors, samplers, communications gear, or food and provisions for human missions. It's as if your one-ton car needed nine tons of gas to make a journey from Los Angeles to New York City because you only get one mile per gallon. Terribly fuel inefficient. But rockets do their job, and they do it well, and they've been doing it for decades, which is basically to get you here, to Earth orbit. In fact, it's been said that once you're in Earth orbit, you're basically halfway to anywhere, since so much of the expense and energy has gone into getting you just into orbit. Now you can pick a destination, but how do you get there? And let's say you want to visit multiple places on one journey. How do we do that? Well, the destinations you want to visit and the length of time that you want to stay there strongly affect the onboard fuel mass percentage of your spacecraft. Essentially, fuel needs rise exponentially with, the, with increases in payload, destinations, and stay times. 
This, of course, affects the overall mass of your spacecraft, which can't go beyond particular limits because modern rockets can only carry so much into low Earth orbit. So let's look at some spacecraft and see how they've done on the onboard fuel percentage. Most of you are familiar with the Apollo missions of the late 60s and early 70s. And these were big gas guzzlers, over 60% fuel, but you can imagine why. It takes a lot of fuel to get astronauts to the moon, land them on the moon, and then take them back. Plus, they have to take all the provisions they need for their stay. So big gas guzzlers, but pretty amazing voyages. On a sad footnote, the Saturn V rocket, the most powerful rocket that the US ever built, the rocket which brought the Apollo astronauts to the moon and could have taken them even further, is now a thing of history. When the program was dismantled over three decades ago, probably before most of us in this auditorium were born, the, the Saturn V rockets, which were scheduled for later Apollo missions, were scrapped and ended up being expensive lawn ornaments at NASA field centers, a pretty sad state. These incredible launch vehicles were capable of taking 30 tons in, into low Earth orbit, when later launch vehicles were capable of much less, which even more limited the amount of tonnage you could put on a spacecraft to head to any of the, the various destinations in the solar system. But, but mission designers were able to do with what they had, and they did very well. Some of the most interesting voyages were done by the, the Pioneer and Voyager probes. These were sent out as high-speed scouts to fly by the outer planets and send back the first ever close-up images of those worlds. The Voyager probes were launched from Cape Canaveral, Florida in 1977, a rare planetary lineup that occurs only once every 175 years meant that the spacecraft could use gravity assists to reduce their trip times and the amount of onboard fuel that they needed. But even then, the spacecraft was nearly half fuel, 46%. But Voyager resulted in an immensely successful mission, revealing the outer planets at a level, uh, at a level of detail unknown before. From their quick flybys of the planets, tons of interesting scientific data was gathered data that scientists are still pouring over today. The pioneers and voyagers are still cruising out there. They're the only man-made objects ever to escape the solar system. Many questions were left in the wake of these truly pioneering voyages, questions which later spacecraft would begin to answer, such as Galileo, a Jupiter orbiter which provided the evidence for the oceans beneath Jupiter's icy moons. Galileo recently ended its mission just last year in a final plunge into the giant planet, yielding scientific data until the bitter end. But Galileo was still a bit fuel heavy, being 42% fuel. Now, don't think that planets and moons are the only interesting destinations out there. There's a lot of debris floating out there that we call asteroids, comets, and Kuiper Belt objects. And these are believed to be leftover remnants from the origin of the solar system. And by studying these remnants, we get insight into how our solar system formed and how other stellar systems formed. One interesting mission that went to an asteroid was the NEAR mission. NEAR stands for Near Earth Asteroid Rendezvous. And that's exactly what it did. It rendezvoused with an asteroid which is close to the Earth's orbit. In fact, it orbited that asteroid and then had enough fuel at the end of its journey that it could land on the asteroid. And this is pretty spectacular. In an entirely different category altogether is the Genesis mission, a solar wind sample return mission. Genesis has been sunbathing for about two and a half years, gathering particles streaming from the sun to bring them back to Earth this September. Genesis does all this for a fuel mass percentage that is an order of magnitude less than most missions, only 4% compared to over 40%. How it does this is something I'll, I'll get to later, but Genesis is a truly revolutionary space mission. Now, for comparison with something that you're familiar with, your car, when you, you uh, fill it up with fuel, is about 5% fuel, and it could probably get you from LA to San Francisco, although you might be driving in on fumes. And I show an SUV here 
but uh, since most of us here are probably students, maybe it's more appropriate to show <laughs> your broken down 1972 gremlin, which could maybe make it to Bakersfield if, if you're lucky. The upshot of all this is that given the fixed size of spacecraft that can be launched into Earth orbit, less fuel means more payload and more science. And in the bottom line terms that NASA managers have to deal with, this means more bang for buck for NASA missions. To drive this home, think of the following scenario. Here you are in Los Angeles, and let's say you want to take a trip. You want to see some of the big cities in the US. Let's say Denver, Dallas, Chicago, and then end up in New York City. Well, you could hop on a plane, which doesn't stop, and fly by all these cities at high speed, taking a few pictures as you whiz by each. This fast flyby approach is like that of the Pioneer and Voyager probes, which got a big rocket boost at the beginning of their journey. The fast flyby approach would be a good first trip if you don't really know much about the destination. If you want to analyze your photos and then pick the places that seem in interesting and take more time to look at them in, in detail. The drawback of the fast flyby approach is that it's hard to take more time around a planet because you have to use a lot of fuel to slow down and get into orbit around that planet. So one needs to try another approach. So now suppose you want to do that cross-country trip again, but you want to do it by car. Let's say the SUV. Let's drop the gremlin. But there's no refueling allowed, so you have to do it on one tank of gas. There may be some clever choice of path that takes you to all the cities. To do this, you may have to go out of your way to avoid mountain ranges like the Rockies, or at least get to them at their smallest, and you'll have to coast down slopes as much as possible. The key would be working with gravity as much as possible and fighting against it the least. Such a path may be hard to find, but not impossible. And there may be other paths, such as one that visits one city and then comes back and does it in the most fuel-efficient way possible. Well, this is exactly what Genesis and other future missions will do. The strange path that you see here is Genesis's journey through the Earth's neighborhood. It's an extremely fuel-efficient path because it works with gravity as much as possible and doesn't fight it. In fact, this path is practically a natural path of the system. Another future mission concept which uses a similar approach is what I've dubbed a multi-moon orbiter. Imagine we want to design a spacecraft path that orbits each of the moons of Jupiter that I talked about earlier. In this approach, one works with the gravitational pulls of each of the moons to find a path which does just what we want it to do, orbit the moons. And when in orbit, the spacecraft can analyze in detail the surface and subsurface of each of those moons and get definitive answers about the possible oceans I mentioned before. Now, just as we can map out the clever paths for a fuel-efficient road trip across the US, we can map out all the clever paths through the solar system. As they require little fuel and therefore little energy, they are known as low-energy passageways. Some journeys which would never have been possible given the fuel constraints of spacecraft are now possible by following these passageways as they wind between the planets and moons, like a gravitational current. Conceptually, this is not a new thing. In fact, it's a very old thing. The mariners of old knew what paths to take across the ocean by observing the ocean currents and then following them. Once they've mapped out all the natural currents, they just had to hop on the currents that they wanted to to get to where they needed to go. Otherwise, the journey would have taken much longer or may even have been impossible. And just as those mariners discovered the natural currents by observation, we're able to discover the low energy passageways in the solar system by observing the movement of natural objects, such as comets and asteroids, the tracers of the celestial currents, if you will. By understanding more about how comets naturally follow these low energy passageways, we can consider sending out spacecraft on those same passageways. A natural question to ask to begin understanding and using these paths is, what makes a comet or asteroid move along such strange paths? The answer lies in breaking down the problem into bite-sized pieces, pieces that we can later fit together into a coherent whole. We look at the motion of a particle, be it a comet, 
or a spacecraft in a gravity field of only two bodies at a time. For example, let's look at the motion of a comet in the field of the Sun and Jupiter. This problem is simplicity itself when it comes to physics problems. Calculate the orbit of the comet whose interaction with Jupiter and the Sun is only through their gravitational pulls. Building on Johannes Kepler's work in the 16th century, Isaac Newton in the 17th century solved the two-body problem, Jupiter going around the Sun, for example. But throwing a third mass into the mix gives a complex interplay of shifting forces. You can fit the equations for this three-body problem into a corner of the blackboard somewhere, but the subtleties in it are very interesting. Many scientists through the years have worked on it because it's one of the simplest problems that's complicated enough to test out theories on. But Newton got fed up. After some effort, he declared the three-body problem unsolvable. But let's not give up so easy. Let's not pull a Newton. <laughs> let's think of Jupiter as a bowling ball sitting on a taut rubber sheet. The depression the ball makes in the sheet is its gravitational well. To knock a marble, the comet, or spacecraft, up out of that well takes energy, and quite a lot of it. But if the, if the marble were balanced on a cusp, such as where Jupiter's well and the Sun's well meet, the forces would balance one another. And the slightest sneeze or a mere feather touch would nudge the comet away, because this is an, an unstable point. So you park there at your own risk, if you dare do it at all. The 18th century mathematician Leonard Euler discovered the existence of three such points of balance, where the gravitational and rotational forces balance, since Jupiter is moving in an orbit around the Sun. A contemporary of Euler, Joseph Louis Lagrange, rounded out the assortment of points by finding two more. Even though Euler made his discoveries first, this set of five points is known collectively as the Lagrange points. So apparently Lagrange had a better press agent than Euler, and such is the history of science. The points are designated L1 through L5, and they exist between every pair of massive bodies, the sun and its planets, the planets and their moons, and so on. But only two of these points, L1 and L2, are of direct interest for understanding low energy passageways, as they form two gates on either side of the planet. At the end of the 19th century, the French mathematician Henri Poincaré made perhaps the most significant contributions to this problem. He did not solve the three-body problem, in fact, he proved that a simple general solution did not exist. However, Poincaré was the first to appreciate the complicated behavior that could result from the motion of the third body, such as the spaghetti-like path I've shown here. The geometric methods that he used to come to this conclusion laid the foundation for what has come to be known popularly as chaos theory. But it's important to keep in mind that when I say chaotic, I don't mean random. Chaotic-looking paths like this one do exist in, in the problem, but they are similar to ocean currents in that they are predictable. Poincaré simplified the chaotic spaghetti mess by organizing similar orbits into special surfaces. For example, one can go into orbit about L1, even though there is no material point there. There are similar orbits encircling L2. Following Poincaré, work by myself and others has shown that there are families of paths that wind onto and off of these orbits around L1 and L2. These surfaces look like tubes. Some of them wind off orbits and some of them wind onto them. The surfaces are made up of many individual paths. For example, a path on the red tube on the left is starting on the L1 orbit and then winding off of it, staying on the surface. Where tubes intersect, say the tube winding off of the L1 orbit and the tube winding onto the L2 orbit, then we have something that goes from the L1 orbit to the L2 orbit. But these tubes have another interesting physical property. If you're on them, you go from one orbit to another orbit. But if you're inside them, you go from one place to another, like that chaotic orbit I showed earlier. So one can think of there being a gateway at L1 and another one at L2, and the tubes approaching or departing them as the passageways taking you in and out of the domain of the planet. 
So now we have a way of organizing the natural paths for this system. What we have found is that the planets and moons are connected by a vast network of these passageways in space that run between points of balance in the solar system. This is the interplanetary transport network. To illustrate this, we can consider the historical record of a comet named Oterma during its strange journey from 1910 to 1980. First, we'll look at the path of the comet in an inertial frame, a frame fixed relative to the distant stars, the frame in which you're probably used to seeing orbits. In this frame, we have the sun at the center and the orbit of Jupiter shown in black. Oterma is shown where it was in 1910, and we'll follow it on its interesting journey. The comet starts completely outside the orbit of Jupiter. Then after passing by the planet, it orbits completely inside the orbit of Jupiter until the two meet back up again, and now Oterma's back outside the orbit of Jupiter. This is some complicated looking stuff, and it's hard to make sense of it here. So we have to look at the path in a new way. We have to look at it in a new frame. We look at it in what's called the rotating frame. In this frame, the sun and Jupiter are fixed on the horizontal axis, the sun here in the center, and then Jupiter here. And the large C that you see is an energy barrier that the comet cannot cross. You could think of it as a no-fly zone for the comet. But the C opens up around the two balance points near Jupiter, L1 here and L2. I've also shown a piece of the L1 and L2 passageways in green. Now, as we follow Oterma's path in this frame, we see that it follows the passageways almost as if it were on railroad tracks. The entire passageways are much larger. I only showed the pieces of them which match uh, Oterma's orbit. The orbit may look unfamiliar because we're not used to looking at orbits in a rotating frame. The advantage of the rotating frame is that now we can see the pattern. We now know that Oterma is following these low energy passageways. And if a comet can do it, why can't a spacecraft? A comet doesn't even have any thrust control, whereas a spacecraft does. So a spacecraft ought to do things like this, but even more efficiently. Space travel along these passageways would slash the amount of fuel that we would need to explore and develop our solar system. And the place to start is to look in our own neighborhood, our own backyard, the region around the Earth. The Lagrange points in the Earth's neighborhood are shown here in a rotating frame where the Sun-Earth line is fixed as the horizontal. The Sun is far to the left. The Earth is shown here, and we have the Moon. The five Lagrange points in the Earth-Moon system are labeled LL1 through 5 for lunar Lagrange. And the two closest Sun-Earth Lagrange points are labeled EL1 and EL2. For the Sun-Earth pair, L1 lies on the line joining the Sun and, and the Earth about 1.5 million kilometers from the Earth in the direction of the Sun. Because of its unobstructed view of the Sun, the Sun-Earth L1 is a good place to put instruments for doing solar science. And the Genesis sample return mission does exactly that. Launched in August 2001, the Genesis spacecraft has been sweeping up specks of the sun, individual atoms of the solar wind, on five collector arrays about the size of bicycle tires and on, in a, an ion concentrator. In fact, professor of nuclear geochemistry, Don Burnett, is the principal investigator for this mission. Genesis will return its solar wind cargo to Earth in a sample return capsule which will parachute into Utah this September. Now, we could let the, the capsule parachute all the way down to the surface, but that's considered too dangerous because the impact could be too great. So because these samples are incredibly fragile, the capsule will be snagged in midair by a helicopter. And apparently, this is a procedure which the US government has done hundreds of times, and I'm not really sure why. <laughs> but, but let's just accept it. Yeah, I think so. The sample will be the only extraterrestrial material brought back to the Earth since the Apollo landings in, in 1972, and the first sample to ever be brought back from beyond the moon's orbit. 
And part of the reason that Genesis was feasible is because it used these low energy passageways. It was parked at what's called a halo orbit around the Sun-Earth L1. So called because when viewed from the Earth, it seems to trace out a halo around the Sun. And one question you might be asking is, well, why not go to the L1 point itself? But that's not a good idea. And it's not a good idea because the spacecraft's radio signals would be lost in the sun's glare, whereas a halo orbit does not get lost in the sun's glare. Genesis took a low energy passageway to get to, from the Earth to its halo orbit, where it's been for about two and a half years. And now it's on its way back home. I think it's about here, just passing by the orbit of the moon. And it's, it's coming back on another low energy passageway. Here I show several low energy passageways coming off of Genesis' halo orbit. These are all pieces of one sheet, of a tubular sheet coming off of that halo orbit. And they have wildly different behaviors. Some of them escape from the, the Earth system altogether. Some seem to get trapped in some orbit around the Earth. And some come to where we, we want them to go, to Utah, in fact. <laughs> which is re remarkable. And Genesis does its huge e exotic trajectory using very little fuel. In fact, it uses less than five hundredths of one percent of the fuel that it takes to get a rocket into Earth orbit. And it's created a great deal of interest in the mathematical and astronomical communities. This work on Genesis inspired its lead designer, Martin Lowe, and myself to explore the dynamics in Earth's neighborhood in a deeper way. We knew that NASA desired to develop a robust and flexible capability to visit different destinations. Therefore, we proposed a lunar gateway station at the lunar L1 point as a transportation hub to get humanity beyond low Earth orbit. In fact, we proposed the station not at the L1 point itself, but in one of these orbits around the lunar L1. This lunar L1 gateway station we envisioned as a transportation hub to get humanity beyond low Earth orbit. The fortuitous arrangement of low energy passageways in near Earth space implies that lunar L1 and L2 halo orbits are connected to halo orbits around the Earth L2 and L1 via these low energy passageways. Many of NASA's future space telescopes will be located around Earth's L1 and L2 and may be built at such a lunar gateway station and then deployed to their final destination with minimal fuel requirements by hopping between the tubes. And by hopping between the tubes, I just mean we have broken down the system into two different tube pieces and the tubes just naturally match up in space. Here's an example. Suppose our astronauts have built one of these deep space telescopes at a lunar L1 gateway station, and they want to deploy it to its final destination, which is a, an Earth L2 halo orbit. Well, starting from the gateway station, for just a little bit of thrust, <coughs> the smallest possible maneuver, we can take the spacecraft from the lunar gateway station to its final destination with a transit time of only a little over a month. You can think of the Lunar L1 Gateway Station as the closest rest stop on the interplanetary superhighway of crisscrossing passageways through the solar system. Astronauts could get there within a matter of days, and when instruments such as the Deep Space Telescope that they've recently deployed require servicing, they may be returned from the Earth Lagrange points to the Gateway Station where human servicing could be performed, which was shown to be of vital importance for the Hubble Space Telescope to remain operable. And now let me show you a movie which illustrates that. Looking from the sun, we're looking toward the Earth-Moon system. Here's the Earth, and here's the moon in, in its orbit. And 1.5 million kilometers away from the Earth, we see a halo orbit around the Earth L2. Now as we zoom in on the moon, we see that the gateway on the left is connected to the gateway on the right by tubes. The red tubes are the off-ramps, and the green tubes are the on-ramps to the gateways. 
let's imagine that our astronauts have built a deep space telescope at the Lunar Gateway Station, which is shown in yellow. We zoom out from the zoom moon so we can show its tubes in the Earth system. We now send this telescope, represented by a yellow dot, to a halo orbit about Earth's L2 via the tubes of the two systems. And at the right instant, with just a nudge, the telescope enters the tube leading to the Earth halo orbit, where scientific observations could begin. The Earth's L2 region is an excellent place for deep space telescopes, such as the Terrestrial Planet Finder, because it's looking away from the Earth. It doesn't have to worry about radio interference from Earth. But it's difficult to send humans there because of a three months long transit time and a harsh space environment. But it's easy to get astronauts to the Lunar Gateway Station. So if our telescope ever needed repair, it could come back via these tubes and get to the Lunar Gateway Station where it could be repaired. And it could do this for very little fuel. So with the spacecraft back at the Gateway Station, the astronauts can repair it. Since the Gateway Station can be reached from Earth in just a matter of days, the infrastructure and complexity of long-term space travel is greatly mitigated. Spacecraft leaving the Gateway Station could reach any point on the surface of the moon within hours, making it a perfect location for a return of humans to the moon. The lunar L1 gateway is also an excellent point of departure and arrival for interplanetary flights to Mars, the asteroids, and the outer solar system. In fact, inspired by this work, officials at NASA's Washington headquarters proposed <laughs> a long-term vision for expanding the human presence in space that involved a lot of different hubs. So represented here as a metro map, something even managers can understand, the Lunar L1 Gateway Station could be used as a stepping stone to the moon, other points in the Earth's neighborhood, and beyond. But using low energy passageways is in no way limited to the inner solar system. For example, let's return to Jupiter's moons. A possible new class of missions to the outer planet moon systems has been proposed by myself and colleagues. These are missions in which a single spacecraft orbits several moons of Jupiter or any of the other outer planets, allowing for long duration observations rather than short flybys. For example, a, a multi-moon orbiter could orbit each of Jupiter's planet-sized moons, Callisto, Ganymede, Europa, and, and Io, using one spacecraft, one after the other, using a technologically feasible amount of fuel. Here's an example of a low energy tour which visits Europa and Io on its way to plunging into Jupiter. Beginning in one of these tubes which is heading towards Europa, we get to Europa, orbit it for some amount of time, exit on some tube leaving Europa till it meets up with the tube going towards Io, orbit Io for some amount of time, and then following Galileo's lead, plunge into the giant planet. These low energy paths can take many different forms, and we can design many different types of tours, such as a spacecraft which visits Ganymede on its way to Europa. And, this, and the spacecraft can stay at each moon in a high inclination orbit, which is of high value to scientific missions. In this movie, I show one of those intermoon transfers, this one between Ganymede and, and Europa, all in an inertial frame. Without the low energy passageway approach, the fuel requirements for such a mission would be prohibitively high, taking such a mission out of the realm of possibility. This transfer, for example, which I designed a couple of years ago, uses half the fuel of a traditional approach to transfers, such as the, the transfers which brought the Apollo astronauts to the moon. The arrival at Europa is shown here. And the strange corkscrew appearance arises because of the third body effects, which are key to the low energy passageways. In 2001, I designed a multi-moon orbiter which visited all of the icy moons using hardly any fuel at all. In fact, using less fuel than the Genesis trajectories. At the time, I didn't know what this would lead to. But this concept is now being considered by NASA as the Jupiter Icy Moons Orbiter which would launch sometime in 2012 
or perhaps later. This mission would pioneer a powerful new capability for exploring space for decades to come. Once the spacecraft were in Earth orbit, it would deploy thruster assemblies and other equipment that it'll need for its journey. And this spacecraft would use ion propulsion to get around. Turning on the ion engines, the spacecraft would begin its interplanetary journey to Jupiter and use those same en engines to slow itself down once at Jupiter. Once in orbit around Jupiter, it would use these low energy passageways to get into an orbit around Callisto, where cameras and other instruments would examine that world in detail. After months at Callisto, the spacecraft would then move on to Ganymede, the next icy moon, and would also be using the low en energy passageways to get there. Once at, Callisto, once at Ganymede, it would use a range of instruments to map the surface and search for organic compounds. And then it would be on your to Europa, the moon whose ocean may lie closest to the surface. The detailed study of Europa using ice penetrating radar and other instruments would reveal whether that world is a possible habitat for life and would provide tons of valuable data for astrobiologists and planetary scientists. Now we've only touched on some of the exciting usage of these low energy passageways through space. One can imagine multi-moon orbiters to the other giant planets in the solar system and even other ideas that just haven't been thought of yet because this is, this is a large scale project like the Human Genome Project but on an astronomical scale and there's still much more mapping to be done before we have charted out all the celestial currents. So thank you for your time.